Welcome to this Project Aspiro audio feature. Today we'll be talking about orientation and mobility with Mark Rankin, an orientation and mobility specialist with CNIV. So Mark, what does an orientation and mobility specialist do? Uh, okay, so what we do is we, we teach blind or partially sighted individuals how to travel safely and independently. So as the title suggests, there's really two components to this. The orientation component being figuring out where you are uh, and where you need to get to and what the steps are in between to do that. Uh, and it's a big component for, for people who have uh, little or no sight. Uh, and then the other is the mobility, which is the sort of techniques most people are familiar with with seeing somebody who uses a white cane, uh, that sort of thing. And that's sort of how to get those, uh, complete that route uh, by avoiding obstacles or obstructions or changes in elevation and things that usually aren't a problem for people who can anticipate these visually, but if you don't have that sort of uh, visual input, that they're a lot more tricky. I see. So it's kind of the where you are part of it and then kind of where you're going part of it? Yeah, and then how am I going to be safe on that? that route once I figure that out. So it's a lot of mental mapping, uh, converting maybe auditory input into sort of a, a, a picture in your mind that may not be the same one that a, that a person with a regular sight would have, uh, but that allows you to sort of move through that space with uh, almost the same level of efficiency. And what are the different ways that people with vision loss uh, travel independently? Okay, so there, they're usually using a combination of different things, um, and we've talked a little bit about you know making land, establishing landmarks and building a mental map, um, using the the vision that they have left. If there is still some vision, you're always using that. Um, but there's also basic techniques. So sighted guide is one that a lot of people are familiar with, which is just using a sighted uh, person to uh, help you through a certain environment. So what a sighted person would do is you just take their their elbow um, and then. As they're walking, you sort of control how fast or slow you're, walk, you're walking by sort of pressure on their arm to give them an indication. And you'll be able to tell whether someone's come from, with you guiding them or not. Um, but they help you to avoid obstacles. And if it's a place that you're not going to be going on a repeated basis, you know, there's a limit to how many routes and environments you can learn. So if you're only going to go play once, someplace maybe once every six months or one, it's a one-off, uh, it's probably easier just to get someone to guide you um, then try to figure it out on your own um, or try to learn it ahead of time or that sort of thing. Um, so I know people that will even, even myself, someone who might be a really good traveler, but they're learning a route for the first time. Well, it might be easier to walk through that while I'm guiding them. And then that way they don't have to worry about every step or getting lost or anything like that uh, or bumping into things. What they're doing is they're getting a sense for how long it's going to take them to complete that route. Mm -hmm. They can listen to what sort of things they're going to hear on the way. If they have some vision, they can figure out what they're able, going to be able to see on the way. Um, and that way they get a sense of what it's going to be like to travel the route eventually. So they get a good overall sort of um, impression of what that's going to be like. And then we start to go back and build on the little individual skills. Um, and the, they could also, the, the skills we may end up working on might be using a cane. So, and a cane can be used um, kind of as a probe to feel around for different things, but also just to find obstacles or changes in elevation um, that your, your eyes would, would alert you of otherwise. Um, some people, after a period of training um, with an orientation mobility specialist, they, they find that they're quite independent, quite capable, uh, they might want to get a dog. Uh, the advantage of a dog being that a dog is really good for avoiding obstacles um, because it can avoid them without actually contacting them. Whereas mm -hmm. a cane, you have to sort of bump into something with the cane before you know it's there often to get around it. Um, so complex environments where there's a lot of obstacles and there's not a clear route through it, a dog can sort of get you through it in a, in a less direct manner. Um, and then that's the whole process of applying to a, a, a school that's an independent school that, that does the training and then you go and usually it's a residential program and, you, and you're there and you get paired up with a dog and you get training and then you get some follow-up back there. Um, and you'd probably still continue to work with an orientation with a specialist back in your community. Um, sometimes even relearning groups because they're going to feel different now with a dog than they would um, with a cane. Um, and then the People will also sometimes, uh, it's a minority, but sometimes people will use electronic travel aids. There's some that give you indications um, of obstacles in advance. Uh, more likely they'd use one that's more like an orientation aid, like a GPS. So a talking GPS is one that's been a real boon to people with, with vision impairment lately because suddenly they're getting information about the environment that it would be really difficult to, to obtain otherwise. Um, but yeah, those are sort of the main, the main ones people get around. And how does the, the talking GPS work exactly? Uh, well, just like any GPS, only it, it, well, it depends on the system, right? Mm -hmm. So um, 
you can you can use it different ways. So some you can set so that it'll sort of um, read out where it, some have a function where like a where am I function, so you can hit it and it, you get an immediate indication of where you are. Others you have to actually travel a route, and you can uh, what what it works really well for uh, for people with 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 little or partial sight is you can you can bookmark. Um, landmarks or points of interest mm -hmm. on your route so you can customize the route in a way that's best for you so um, maybe you know bookmarking Starbucks is fine and that's what most regular GPSs do but maybe the route there you need to know four or five things uh, on the way maybe there's a tree branch that whacks you in the head every time you go down there because someone isn't trimmed you can mark that so you get an advanced warning right approaching yeah. tree bush and you duck yeah. and wow that's like magic right but yeah. that is something you were never able to do before but I mean more likely for wayfinding right so you can um, put points in there that will help you to locate yourself on the route so you know mm -hmm. oh, I'm halfway because I've just uh, just hit that whatever that is right mm -hmm. I've okay. hit that overhang where the awning comes out from the building I'm pretty sure that's the one, but just to be sure, I've bookmarked it now. It's an announcing that it is that it is that awning. It's not something else that I'm hearing, and yeah. so I know, you know, I'm reassured that I'm on the right track and I'm halfway there. And uh, how do you decide what skills to teach someone who is blind or partially sighted in the area of orientation and mobility? Mm -hmm. So it always starts with an assessment with the individual. Um, usually, we sit down and we we're very goal based, so we talk about. Um, you know, what are the things that you really can't do that maybe you could do formally if you had sight? Um, and then they sort of, they, they, they'll go through a process of this is what I miss most or this is what I need to do most of all, um, and then you kind of build on that. So it can be it can be simple. So it might be a senior who's maybe had macular degeneration, um, was able to do most little trips by herself. Uh, maybe the big thing for her is just to get across the corner store. And she can't cross because she can't see the lights anymore. She's safe on the route otherwise and pretty much has it memorized because she's been living there forever, uh, but just needs a little bit of help there. So we'll go and work on identifying the traffic flows and figuring out how she can cross the street safely. That's pretty cut and dry. Um, if you've got someone who's maybe had total vision loss, they can literally be lost in their own home, you know, getting from the bathroom back to the... And I'm sure you've had this experience, right? You get up in the middle of the night and it's pitch black and... You turn the wrong way going to the washroom, even though you know quite well where it is. Sure. Um, so you work on a lot more of uh, sort of uh, foundational skills, um, working on training, hearing, um, anything you can do to, to compensate for that visual input that they're not getting anymore, so that they're still able to sort of put that picture together. Um, you also have to. There's always a few things that you sort of would suggest anyway, right? Based on a safety assessment. So if they've just moved into a new place, you want to make sure that they learn the emergency exits, no matter what, because that's sort of an essential, right? So there's goals that we would, as mobility instructors, also sort of say, well, you know what? It would be, you know, I think one thing you've got to figure out how to do is this. Um, and then you also look at levels of, of independence too. So crossing the street is one that you have to get right. Um, there might be other ones that they want to try and they're not 100% sure. Maybe they've never traveled in the subway, but they want to try it. So there's a process of assessing whether or not that goal is going to be achievable, whether it's one that they really want. Um, and they change as you're going along too, right? With the training, sometimes people's worlds start to open up a little bit and they think, well, you know what, maybe the corner store is not the limit. Maybe I can do more. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to be open all the way through the process, right? It's not like you decide on the first visit and then that's that. It, it continues. And that's part of the relationship, too. It evolves as people get a little bit more of a taste of independence and what might be possible. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely a uh, like an ongoing process and a mm -hmm. kind of assessing things as you go process. Yeah, definitely. And very different, too. I mean, if, if you're working, say, with a child, um, then it's a totally different process of they're not going to have goals, um, and their parents may have some goals about what they want, but with a child with very little or no sight, then you're going to be working on sort of developmental goals, which is that, well, you know that kids typically want to end up doing this, and you want to keep them as close to normal development as possible, but uh, for them, conceptually, they don't get the same input as their sighted peers, so they develop concepts a lot slower. So you want to work on environmental concepts. Like they might have a understanding of a door just based on the fact that someone every day opens a door and pushes them through. Well, they don't really have a full understanding of that. Their concepts tend to be very limited. So putting together a, a full picture based on the partial hands-on experience they have or the partial auditory experience they have. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's a lot of you know making sure that they develop as close to the way that their sighted peers do as possible. 
uh, directional concepts, so not just you know, forward, backward, up, down, and cardinal directions. Um, some of the other things are spatial concepts. When you don't continually see things being placed in relation to each other, then it's a lot harder to get concepts of above and below and under and in front of and relate your body to those things. So those things are really important too. So with kids, it's a lot of directed playing, letting them get, get these experiences that maybe their sighted peers would because if a bird flies by, they automatically track it and they're getting all these concepts that so they're developing of movement just naturally, right? And with kids with very little vision, then you're going to have to sort of give them opportunities to, to try the same things. But they are different motivations, so you're working on a lot of sort of doing all these things to get them to get these experiences that are necessary to develop these concepts mm. and also to develop the actual physical, physical ability to move through space in, in a purposeful way. So. Mm-hmm. Did you say that the term... Uh, auditory training, or did you say, or he, or hearing training? Did you use that earlier? Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a big component, especially if there's is very little or no vision. Then you're gonna mostly the way you orient to the world then is by using sound sources. Um, you know, you, you take direction from from sounds in the environment. So, um, a good example is crossing streets, right? So you use this, the the surge of traffic when the traffic starts to cross the street. You know that that light has changed. You also use the sound of traffic to get a sense of how straight you're walking, so you try to estimate that. But there's a lot of um, work that goes on beforehand, so you develop a sensitivity. Um, some sound, some places just have different sort of ambient sounds, so you walk in and you can... I, I, I know people who are totally blind who can walk into a room and snap their fingers and get a pretty good sense of how big it is and wow. what the dimensions are like, which seems like magic to us, wow. uh, but is the result of a lot of experiences, uh, a lot of trial and error for them um, that allows them to put, put this together, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's been a lot of training, um, a lot of guided experience going on to like, get them to that point. I see. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Um, and so... Uh, uh, so I, the term independent travel skills, is that a component of, of what you're talking about now, or is that something different? Is that... um, it's, it's, it's all, I guess that's the goal is independent travel. Um, what that looks like is, can be different for different people. Um, but, you know, if, if you still have some functional vision, then your independent travel might be finding visual landmarks that are going to help you. So it may be walking down the sidewalk. Maybe your issue is finding a particular address. You're not able to read address numbers or whatever. So you're using landmarks on the street. Right? Maybe you're using the fire hydrant or the shrubs at the edge. And you can see those or you can find those with a cane or something. Hmm. Um, so it, it's, it's different. But if it, generally the less, the less vision you have, then the more you're relying on either something auditory or something tactual if you're actually feeling around with a cane or... Could be a, it, it, it's actually several things usually at once, right? And which one's working better? So maybe here you're going to be relying on, on hearing because you're walking by a bus shelter and there's a bit of an echo and you know that you passed that. Mm-hmm. Another spot it might be, well, you know there's a certain slope, you know, detecting street corners. Some people do it because there's a slope. Some people do it because they hear the intersecting traffic. Um, what, rel- what they do... Depends on preference. It depends on what works best in the given environment. Okay. Uh, it's a whole mixture of things, but that's what, in the end, gives you an independent traveler and gives you the skills necessary for independent travel. I see. Okay, interesting. Um, and so, you know, given Project Aspiro is a, uh, a career planning and, and employment website, what would you say are some? And obviously, these kind of the things you're talking about are kind of building the foundation that people need um, throughout life, and then particularly. Uh, then later in life when they're doing whatever, but as it might apply to a career, what what um, are sort of some of the more common orientation mobility skills that people might require for a workplace setting? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, like there's been a lot, like there's been a lot of sort of foundational experiences and, and, and work, so that the things that we're talking about in terms of, uh, say, someone who's congenitally blind or a visually impaired that grows up without vision. Um, hopefully we, we've gone through all these things where they can localize sound. Um, they're able to look at you when you're talking. So there's all those little components that sort of are important for socialization have been put in place because there's just been a lot of opportunities for them to experience those. Um, and then in the actual terms of uh, the workplace, um, it's really important to be able to 
have really good orientation skills. So be able to put together a really good sort of mental map of your surroundings. Um, and that's mostly by a variety of experiences, right? By going to, so to be widely traveled really helps you to quickly do that in a new environment. Um, in a, especially if you're starting or you're, you're ready for a career, you, you don't want to be highly dependent on others um, around the office. You want to kind of get up to speed as quickly as possible. So in terms of learning the root of uh, learning roots, learning layouts in your own environment, it's really, really that's like the key thing. You want to get your orientation down so you're not asking for directions. You're not getting confused and not being able to problem solve your way out of it, that sort of thing. Um, and there's a lot of specific things. You want to be able to, um, inside uh, a workplace, for instance, eventually you want to be able to uh, organize your own workspace so that it's not cluttered and that you can move back and forth freely without having to grab your cane and trail a wall or that sort of thing. Um, all the other things you can probably learn fairly quickly, um, and it depends on how accessible the building is too, but mm -hmm. there's always there's always work to be done, but hopefully the layout is, is conducive to you learning it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it depends how much you have to travel to. Some people have to travel for work, and then that's a whole other thing. So you're learning multiple routes and multiple locations. Um, mm -hmm. It can be, it can vary greatly how much you're going to need, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, and so let's say someone who's in the in a process of uh, career planning, whether they're kind of starting an interview for a job or they're actually starting a new job. Is there anything that you would? Um, you know, recommend them doing ahead of time in terms of for these activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that I, I see again as much as possible. The orientation is going to be really key. So um, at this point, most of the skills that you've learned are going to be transferable in terms of your basic mobility skills or your your, your sort of travel skills. Um, but what you want to do is get specifically prepared for wherever it is you're going. To, you're thinking about working or where you're going to be working. Um, and that's just kind of like preparing for any job, right? You want to learn as much about the place you're going to be working at as you can. Um, the added provision, if you have a, a vision, visual uh, disability, is that you're going to have to also do work about learning the actual environment that most people would be able to walk in the foyer, take a quick look, scan, and figure out where things are. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you, you know, you want to ideally present yourself as somebody who comes in with a lot of independence and who's also done the work to to learn as much as they can about the place they're going to be working. So if you can get there ahead of time and um, it's a public building and you can walk through and figure out things like how the elevator panel will work, um, where are the meeting rooms, where are the washrooms, what's the office space, is there, you know, and then establish landmarks for yourself so that, you know, if you, you do end up working there, um, and you're going to meet somebody somewhere, you're able to get exactly where it is. Like right now, if I want directions in the subway, I'm more likely to call a blind person than I am a sighted person because their directions will be extremely precise, right? They'll mm -hmm. say, yeah. well, if you want to be close to the elevators at Young, you know what? Get at the front of that blue train, and actually if you're at you know, the middle door of the second train, you can come out, there'll be a phone booth, and then there'll be this. They'll give me very precise directions mm -hmm. because they, they aren't orient themselves very precisely in space. Mm -hmm. um, so in a, in a job site, you want to be able to do that too, right? So, you know, if I'm saying, let's go meet by the front, it's not great for me. <laughs> it's great for a sighted person. I can walk, you know. But if I'm visually impaired, I'm going to want to say to you, you know, let's meet by the fountain at the north corner of the building or, you know, and give you very... So that learning those little bits so that you can... Um, get precise information or convey precise information to people you're working with is going to save you a lot of problem solving if you get very inefficient um, information. Um, you'll find that you and people come, uh, visual impaired people actually, as I said, are really good at giving you directions. So you'll find probably people will come to you and say, how can I explain to someone who's coming to the building how to get to my office? And they'll be able to tell you mm -hmm. have some rights and norths and souths and landmarks and those sorts of things. Um, and then the other thing is, um, if there's a lot of common rooms or meeting rooms or multi-purpose rooms, it's good to go in and get a really good sense of the layout of those ahead of time, so that you know you're not going in and your your de your chair is facing opposite where the maybe the projector is going to be. Even though you might not be able to see the projector, you don't want to have your chair facing the opposite direction because it's socially it's, you stand out. Sure. Like you want to fit in like everyone else. So figuring out you know where you're likely to be oriented in, in the room, uh, figuring out if certain things work better for you. So maybe the 
uh, you want to have your back to the window uh, or you want to make sure ahead of time that the shades are cold if you have a sensitivity to glare. Um, a lot of little things in terms of what's going to make things work best for you. Um, if there's a meeting room that's used frequently, you might want to try and get there early or let it be known that you have a spot that's best for you. So maybe one close to the door so you're not coming in and having to trail around finding an open open seat, right? Um, you want to get in and be discreet, right? Just mm -hmm. like everyone else, not stand out because of your because of your vision. Just fit in like everyone else. Mm -hmm. it sounds like preparation and practice are kind of two big themes. Is that? Yeah, that's. I mean, this the skills uh, that we teach as as orientation mobility specialists are not that difficult and they're not that complex. But it's it's putting them into practice. So the whole. The whole process of becoming an independent traveler is a process of trial and error and building up problem-solving skills. So you've got this bag full of sort of techniques that work, but they don't work all the time and in every possible situation right out of the bag. You've got to adapt them. Mm -hmm. So our role is providing experiences that let you adapt those in a successful way so that your confidence increases and your ability to tackle different kind of situations increase so that eventually you're probably not going to need that much help. You're going to be able to figure out most things on your own because you've sort of had this gradual sense of independence and trying things in different circumstances with different challenges and sort of meeting those and, and succeeding and moving on. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's great. Well, thanks so much, Mark, for uh, coming and talking to us about uh, orientation and mobility. My pleasure.